Welcome everyone. My name is Jen Sharon, NHA's Chief Operating Officer and your moderator for today's third education session in our NHA Summer Series, Developing a Comprehensive Patient Education Program, generously sponsored by McKesson, an NHIA Future of Infusion Advisory Council member, as well as an NHIA Gold member. I wanted to introduce Matt Mitchell, McKinnon's VP of Home Infusion Sales, to tell us a little bit about McKesson. Matt? Thanks, Jen. Folks, welcome and thank you for joining the McKesson Sponsored Developing a Comprehensive Patient Education Program. As Jen said, my name is Matt Mitchell and I'm the Vice President of McKesson Infusion Sales. As you may know, McKesson is a leading distributor of infusion therapy supplies, devices, and pharmaceuticals. McKesson's home infusion portfolio was built to provide the home infusion market with the ability to be serviced by a single source. At McKesson, we are committed to the future of our industry working with facilities to provide not only the products you need at an affordable price, but also with business solutions that assist in running your business more efficiently. Asset management and patient engagement software, such as OneTrack and Verbal Care, are designed to alleviate the strain of both capital equipment management and monthly patient product fulfillment relative to our patient home delivery programs. Partnering with NHIA to support our providers is a pri priority at McKesson. Our efforts with NHIA include guidance and support in managing through acute healthcare events such as COVID-19, as well as support with lobbying and creating legislation that impacts the home infusion market. Thank you again for attending the McKesson Sponsored Developing a Comprehensive Patient Education Program. And at this time, I'm gonna turn it back to Jen. Jen. Thanks, Matt. We truly appreciate McKesson's support for the home infusion industry and NHIA. The summer series is focused on providing you with free education and CE that you would have enjoyed at NHIA's annual conference in April. Make sure to watch Infusion Express for upcoming sessions and the registration links, or visit NHIA's new website, click on Learn CE Education Summer Series to register for future events or catch up on education you missed. Just a couple of housekeeping reminders. The presentation is available for download and the handout section of the navigation pane, as well as the speaker bios. We have had a, a last minute change in the presentation, so I will be uploading that during the presentation. The webinar will be recorded and a link of the recording will be emailed to you following the conclusion of the webinar and will also be available via NHIA's website within 24 hours. In order to receive CE, please follow the link in the follow-up email and answer a short quiz. Following the presentation, we will have time to answer your questions. Please submit your questions via the question tab in the navigation pane at any time during the presentation. Okay, now on to our presentation. Our panel of experts today include Barbara McElroy, Jean Stump, and Jennifer Ashner. These nurse extraordinaires will walk us through creating patient education from theory to implementation. Barbara, I think you're gonna get us started for today. Great, thanks Jen. It's nice to be here and thanks for all of you for attending. I'm so sorry that we're not able to enjoy that NHIA cocktail hour this time, um, only because it's one o'clock noon, but um, it's really nice to have this format and to be able to put, to have, um, I've been attending some of these sessions as well as the uh, poster presentations and I have to say I've, I've really gotten a lot out of them. So hopefully you'll get something um, out of our program today. So we're gonna start with talking about patient education and Jen is gonna control my slides for me. So Jen, if you could kind of pop through, that would be great. Sure, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here, but let me just- Well, restart. and I can probably start even without that. Um, I don't know how to move this thing out of my screen, but let me see if that makes it any better, no. Um, all right, here we go, I got right, it. Great. So what is patient education? Patient education is something that we as nurses do all day, every day, every single patient encounter, regardless of the specialty area we're in. But we certainly know that we do it in home infusion like no other. Um, patient education and providing effective teaching plans is well documented in the literature as providing better patient outcomes. Um, it, it saves money, it saves um, adverse events, et cetera. Sorry, I was looking at something else. So essentially good patient education is essential in realizing best possible outcomes. And today, as we're well into the 21st century, we know that there's been a whole shift in the way that healthcare is reimbursed. In the old days, we got paid for every service we did, you know, fee for service type plans. And today we know that that is not the way that um, payers pay, but rather they're looking at value of care or outcome-based care. 
So our reimbursements are largely based on how well our patients do rather than on the unique things that we did. So an important part of realizing those best outcomes is our patient teaching plan. Unfortunately, as we all know, even though nurses do it all day, every day, we often are not trained in how to provide patient education or how to develop educational plans. Oh, can I go back one for a minute? Sorry. So we, as we say, we lack the pedagogic pedagogical training necessary and for a lot of us we have we don't have the time to develop plans we don't have the resources most of us are understaffed overworked etc so we're hoping that today we can kind of give you a crash course and how best to provide care for your patient's educational needs I have found the two most important things to me in both my personal life and my professional life are the nursing process and the American Nurses Association Code of Ethics for Nurses. Those two documents pretty much give us a framework for everything we need. And like any nursing problem, using the nursing process to develop our educational plan really works. But before we get to developing our plan, it's first important to know a little bit about how learning occurs. Next slide, please. So adult learners, um, adults are primarily our our patient population, even when we're working with children, more often than not, we're really gearing our, our learning or teaching to the adults who are involved in the care. And there are some commonalities among adult learners. They are autonomous, which means they like to be in charge. They're self-directed. And even though they may not know what we're teaching them, they do have prior experiences and other learning that they can use to sort of build the new learning on and so that prior learning and experience comes into play and it's really important for us as a teacher to acknowledge those learners strengths to recognize what they've done before that helps build the confidence that they need when we are trying to teach someone tpn therapy at home just opening the list of i mean just unpacking the bag of supplies can be overwhelming so really kind of acknowledging their strengths what they've learned before what they've done before promotes respect between the teacher and the student, and also enhances the autonomy of the learner. Learners learn best when they understand the rationale for the action. So saying scrub the hub is important, but letting them know that this is the number one way that, uh, that microorganisms get introduced into an IV line gives that scrub the hub more meaning. So really providing the rationale for our action. Learners also like to be treated respectfully and as equal partners. And that means we're much better off starting that dialogue with them when we invite them as equal participants. What time works best for you to meet me for a teach? What, um, you know, what time works best for you to change the IV bag, et cetera? Including them in the teaching learning process, giving them some control over the learning situation makes them feel like they're equal partners and they're as valuable as we are. They also find value in opportunities to apply what they've learned. And that's why those return demonstrations or teach backs are so important because then they have a chance to kind of show us their mastery. Also understanding what learners beliefs are about themselves is going to be essential as we try and target um, the piece of them that's going to be most likely to elicit a behavioral change. When we're teaching someone new skills, we're really asking them to change their behavior. So those are very closely linked. So understanding how people perceive themselves is also equally important. Next slide, please. So there's a couple of ways that people see things um, that can benefit us, uh, that this information can benefit us as we learn, as we develop our teaching plan. The first thing is the health belief model. And this model is kind of loosely, it's kind of based on a couple of things. And I, I think quitting smoking is the one that is the most easy that sort of represents all of these um, different theories. The health belief model in the, in the instance of smoking requires that the patient or individual first recognize that there are some risks with smoking. And then they need to perceive that those risks, negative outcomes could actually happen to them. When we can get people to understand that by doing certain things, i.e. quitting smoking, we actually eliminate those negative consequences, that promotes behavioral change. But if the patient doesn't believe that they might get lung cancer or they might get COPD, that's a lot harder to work with. 
So as we look at our teaching plans, we're going to find, want to find what are those unique things about this learner where I can engage them in the value of this changed behavior. So again, quitting smoking. If I think I'm 16 and nothing can possibly happen to me and that idea that I'm going to be 70 and not be able to breathe is so remote, how can we get that patient to buy into what we're saying today? Because that's where we're going to get someone to change their behavior. So we want to link that intervention to reducing their risk and empowering them that they are part of the team that can achieve optimal health. Very closely tied with the self-efficacy theory. Patients need to believe that they have the ability to accomplish that desired behavior. So if we can build on, uh, okay, I did smoke once, I admit, it's been a long time, but before I quit smoking, I became a nurse. And it was really for me, saying that, oh my gosh, I went to nursing school. I took a and and microbiology and chemistry and I passed. That was really the thing that gave me the power to quit smoking. I relied so much on that accomplishment of becoming a nurse to empower me that I was in charge of my behavior and I could in fact quit smoking. So having patients feel that they're, they're capable of making that change or following the directions that we teach them is really important in our learning plan. And then the last thing, locus of control is a bit more challenging because this has a lot to do with patients' prior upbringing, their cultural beliefs, the way they were raised in their family. If they believe they have control over the outcome, they are much more likely to follow the behaviors that we recommend. So if I believe that quitting smoking, my quitting smoking is going to impact my future health, that's a lot more likely that I'm going to follow through on that behavior then if I believe that maybe some higher power, whether I quit smoking or not, you know, that the higher power or the, the Maharishi, Hushi Mishi, whoever, I didn't mean to say that like that, but whoever is God or um, satellite controls that behavior, then I'm not going to be as likely to follow through on the behavior. So if we have a patient who has that fatalistic ab attitude of what will be, will be, not to say that that's not sometimes a great attitude to have, but that, that takes the locus of control away from them, puts it on an external place, and they're less likely to change behavior. So what I'm really saying here in a nutshell is getting patients to understand the rationale behind the action, getting them to understand the importance of that action in terms of their overall, all, overall outcome, and getting them to see that they actually do have some control over their outcome. And then next slide. The last thing, the next thing that we want to talk about in terms of developing our educational plan is how do learners learn? And we kind of remember um, Bloom's taxonomy of learning. And these are the three components of that. We have the cognitive, and that's really our brain function, where most learning occurs, where new knowledge is acquired and where we process knowledge. So for cognitive teaching, those are going to be the things where we give a presentation, or we give them teach sheets, or we discuss, or we give them um, training maps, all the kinds of things that we use in terms of visual or auditory tools. However, there can be some barriers to that. The patient may not be able to read. The patient may be blind. The patient may have a hearing issue. So overcoming those barriers is going to be a challenge in terms of presenting that cognitive part of the um, presentation or the learning. The affective domain is really about our attitudes, values, beliefs, et cetera. And I think this might go back to that idea. If you believe that a higher power is ultimately responsible to whether, as to whether you get better or don't get an infection, it's going to be harder to target that patient than if they believe that they actually are in control. So we want to work with them, whether it's a cultural aspect or whether it's just an upbringing, to kind of try and sway their thinking so that they understand that there may be a higher power running the show, but for today, scrubbing that hub is really critical and in not introducing microorganisms. So for these patients, the teaching strategies in the affective um, domain are things like discussion, simulation, role playing, more of an engagement process versus the didactic component of cognitive. And then lastly, the psychomotor. And this really comes into play with us as infusion nurses because we're expecting patients to have some dexterity and be able to perform some physical skills that they may not have done before. So using things like demonstration, return demonstration, practice sessions, let's meet you again tomorrow and go through it again. Those are important teaching strategies 
in the psychomotor uh, domain. Learning is a process, not an event. I just had to throw that in there because that is so true. It's an ongoing process. And every opportunity, every encounter we have with that patient, we're going to be reinforcing the educational plan. Next slide, please. Age-appropriate strategies for patient education. Well, my um, colleague, Jean Stump, is going to follow this my talk. So she's going to give us a lot more details about pediatric patients. But there are some things that we, of course, you know, have some commonality. One is, of course, for the most part, especially under the age of 10 or 12, our patients, our pediatric patients, are really going to be married, married, excuse me, managed by their adult caregivers. So our learning will still sort of be geared toward that adult teacher. But we also want to know that we want to engage children in lifelong good health habits or health literacy habits. So engaging them early on is not a bad thing. And there are some things that children can do to participate in the care, which makes them both reduces fear, increases compliance, and makes it more of a, a fun participation thing for them rather than just being managed from ahead. Once kids are about 12 years of age, they really start to reach adult ability of comprehension. So we may find in late, you know, for adolescents that they are more engaged and we rely less on the adults, although certainly the adults are going to be ultimately in charge. But again, when we talk with kids, it's going to be important for us to establish rapport with them. And that means things like making eye contact, engaging them, talking about their interests versus our interests, and usually using age and developmentally appropriate language, et cetera. Again, I think I already said this, engaging pediatric patients is really a gift that we're giving them for the lifelong development of health literacy and, and getting them to understand their locus of control, the fact that they do have control over their long-term healthcare outcome. Next slide, please. I think I just threw this one in um, for fun to talk about Piaget because really up until age seven or 11, we're not necessarily going to be doing a lot of, um, we're not going to expect kids under the age of 11 or 12 to really be participating a lot in their care, but we do want to engage them. So just thinking about the things that they can do or cannot do. So if we have a three-year-old, we're not going to get them to understand the importance of scrubbing the hub. But an 11 or a 12-year-old may, and that's the patient that might really benefit from that teaching map, laying out their saline, their antibiotic, their heparin, putting out their alcohol wipes, giving them some kind of uh, active participation in it. And then once they're older than 12, we will see, in fact, that, that they do have a lot more capability. And certainly we want an adult supervising them because we are talking about IV therapy. But the more control we give them, the more engaged they are in the process and the more likely they are to have a better outcome. Next slide, please. So back to the nursing process, right? Provides the framework for plan development. So we start with the assessment. What are the patient, what are the learning needs? What, what needs to be done? Are there any barriers to learning and how can we correct those? What are the nursing diagnoses or the problems that we're going to identify? What do we want to correct? What are we, what are our learning objectives? And I'd like to just take a little minute here. This was a very long time ago. I was approached by a VNA group and asked me to do a two-day program for all of their nurses on IV therapy. And I was so excited by this opportunity. I'm like, awesome. And at the end of my meeting with the chief executive officer of that VNA group, she said, okay, so great. In the next two weeks, do you think you could get those objectives to me? And I said, sure. And I walked out of there and I had no idea what she meant by objectives. And again, if I can just preface this, this was probably 20 years ago. So, and this was actually, in fact, it was 20 years ago because it was before Google. So this must have been around 1996. And I had to go to the local university library to look up learning objectives because I literally did not really understand it. And that was where I first got turned on to Bloom's Taxonomy. And what a difference that made for me. When I started planning based on what I wanted the learner to learn, my outline came together. Where prior to that, when I was doing some little educational programs, I was kind of like, okay, let's start with dressing changes. Oh, wait, let's talk about um, the infusion pump. I was all over the place. So I, I found for me that when I start with what are my learning goals, what are my learning objectives, that really helped me put my plan together. And I'm hoping that same tip might work for you. So again, we want to assess what are the learner's needs, what are the barriers, 
And what are the problems I need to be addressed? I want to prevent infection, right? I want to, so I want to teach them that. When I, and those problems gave me a great building block for what are my objectives. The problem is infection with a central line. The outcome, infection free. What are the steps in between that? And that's where I come up with my implementation. What evidence-based strategies am I going to teach them so that I reach my goal of solving their problem? And then, did it work? Did we evaluate? Did it work? Do I need to come back? Did they get what I did? Did I talk too much about one thing and not enough about another? So evaluation is a really um, important part. And as we've seen, I'm sure some of you have seen this too, that the nursing process is an active process. It really isn't linear as I have it listed today. It's really circular. After my evaluation, okay, I'm a, I evaluate nice tests. What did I fail at? Let's get some new diagnoses or problems identified. Let's look at what those learning objectives should be. So it's a continuum versus a completion. Next slide, please. So let's do a one-on-one -on -one. assess. I probably already did this, but here we go. What are the learner's unique needs? And one thing I read over and over and over, what does the learner need to know versus what I want to teach? So as you can tell already, I'm a bit long-winded sometimes, and it's um, I can get carried away with overwhelming patients by what I think is important instead of looking at what is it really important for the patient to learn. So the patient needs to know to scrub the hub. They don't really need to know about the invention of needless connectors and the prior history of needle stick injuries, right? They need to know scrub the hub. So really tailoring our teaching to the learner versus what we want to talk about. What are the barriers for learning? Are they ready? I saw a note um, in one of our patient charts that they were trying to do an antibiotic teach as the patient was being wheeled down to fluoro to get a pick line placed. That learner was not ready for the teaching. And as you can guess, that patient called 26 times in the first three days because they didn't get the teaching at a time that was appropriate for them. So are they ready? And what are the barriers? How are we gonna work around those barriers? And I'm sure most of you know these statistics generally, that 20% of adults in the US are illiterate. So those beautiful teaching sheets we have where we spell out everything for 20% or one in out of five patients are not gonna benefit by those, by those teach sheets. But they might by the map. You know the map, I'm sure you've all seen those too with your syringe of saline, your little mini bag of medicine, your syringe of saline. So we need to look at how are we going to um, teach those patients who don't have the ability to Google or use our things, developing videos, et cetera. 50% of adults lack health literacy, meaning that when I say scrub the hub or needless connector, they have no idea what I'm talking about. So we want to be sure that we're using the language that the learner needs, not the language that we're most familiar with. And 75% of Americans read at a sixth grade learning level, reading level, excuse me. So short sentences, simple language, bullet the key points, et cetera. And then lastly, 35 million Americans speak another language at home outside of English. So even though they may speak English well, for a lot of people, it is not their primary language. And a lot of the idioms we use may not be meaningful to them. Next slide, please. Which leads us on um, a nice segue into cultural competence. You know, patients come from a variety of different cultures, languages, customs, belief, traditions, even amongst native English speakers. There are so many variations amongst us of how we perceive illness, health, locus of control again, etc. So understanding how culture affects our, our patients, even if they seem like they come from the same culture we do, never mind those that are perhaps born in a different country or came to the United States later. So um, it's important for us to be respectful of that, to work with what we can, and to understand um, where they're coming from. And I, I, this kind of reminds me of a good story. This was, and I, again, probably 20 years ago. I was doing a chemotherapy start on a patient out of the, one of the hospitals I was associated with, and she was Polish speaking. And at that time, it, we had to like reserve like three days in advance to get a language interpreter. But the case manager who had initiated the referral happened to be Polish speaking at all, as well. And she said, I can be the interpreter. And I'm like, great, she's not a relative where she might you know, change things around or there's no secondary gain here. She's gonna do exactly what I talked to her about. My patient was probably in her 50s, but, um, and so was my, 
case manager who was acting as my interpreter. So when I got to the part about safe sex practices related to chemotherapy, the case manager said she doesn't need to know that. I said, no, she does. Like we have to be, we don't know what her story is. And I just remember halfway through this encounter realizing that the, the cultural barrier between me and the case manager was bigger than the one between the patient and I. And I couldn't get her to talk with the patient about some things that I thought were important because of the way she perceived the patient based on her culture and also her own. I know that's a little long-winded story. But so recognizing that culture plays an important part in the teaching plan and in the patient's engagement in their healthcare outcomes. And then my last line here, just a friendly reminder, since I talked about my favorite document in the world, the ANA Code of Ethics for Nurses, the nurse practices with compassion and respect for the inherent dignity, worth, and unique attributes of every person. Sometimes those cultural differences have nothing to do with culture, just have to do with our worldview. And we encounter lots of people who think differently than us. And it is so important for us to be respectful of that person's beliefs, even if we don't find them grounded in the science that we respect. So just a friendly reminder. Next slide, please. So nursing diagnoses. This is my favorite part. I always have used Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and I can remember working with a um, on a pediatric floor with a nurse who got pulled in for a disciplinary action because she had allowed the neonate to sleep through um, sleep through a feeding, and she didn't understand because she felt like sleeping was so important to the kid, and he'd been up all night and crying and blah blah blah, and so she didn't kind of get where where this disciplinary moment had come from when she thought she was addressing the patient's need, which was sleep. But if we look at Maslow, I mean, they're both physiological, but we know that nutrition trumps food, right? Food trumps sleep. Sleep trumps um, self-actualization. Sleep trumps engagement in a puzzle. So there's lots of things, but using Maslow's hierarchy of needs can really guide what is the most important thing. So physiological needs always come before safety and security, love and belongingness, et cetera. So we want to find out what is our diagnosis, um, nursing diagnosis, what do we want to teach, what is the treatment plan, how do we prevent complications, then we want to teach the method of administration, all these things, I, you don't need me to read them. But these are the kind of the things that we're looking at when we talk about developing a, a home infusion plan. What, are we, what is the most important thing that we prevent, you know, adverse events? So hand washing and scrubbing the hub are going to come before talking about supply management. Etc. Next slide, please. Then, what does the patient need to know? What is their learning style? Do they want the big picture, like I might, or do they just want to know what do I have to do A, B, C, D? Or do they want more, more information on rationale? Are they visual, auditory? Do they do best with hands-on? Is showing and then having them show us? Sometimes patients, I used to like to kind of show them, then go through my, learning, my teaching sheet and, and make sure it all made sense and have them show me. But looking at our patients, some want more detail, some want less. And again, what are the critical things that they walk away with today? And what is their preference? Are they better in 15 minute increments or do they want a two hour session? Do they want me to come back three days in a row or do they want to get it all over with at once? So really sort of looking at um, the individual needs and then also what is, what is it that I would need for the patient what does the patient need to know when they leave? Who does what, how, when? This is a really great way of focusing patient-centered outcomes. The patient will verbalize the three steps of a saline flush before they do it, et cetera. Um, and then allow patients the chance to both show us, someone like me who tends to talk over people, to, for, for me to be quiet so they can give it back to me, show me what they need, to show without me interrupting or guiding them, and then allowing them the time that they need to ask questions and to be as positive as we can about the things that they did accomplish, accomplish because that's really how we're gonna build their self-confidence. Next slide, please. And then lastly, the most important step, it, we're, we're our objectives of cheese, and if not, why? Um, did we miss the boat on something when, we, when the patient teaches back and we realize, oh my goodness, I totally forgot about the alcohol wipe or whatever it is. So using that teach back as an opportunity to say, did we focus on that enough? Do I need to focus it again? Can they demonstrate what the steps? Do they have the psychomotor skills required to do those steps? And 
can they answer those what if questions? So I go to flush my line and it won't flush. What do I do? Oh, let's check the clamp. You know, looking at did we answer the questions that might come up? And as I said earlier, the nursing process is an active one. It's really more circular than lin linear. And then of course the ultimate thing for all nurses, documentation. If we didn't write it, we learned this in nursing school and it's still so true today, then we didn't do it. So documenting what we taught and if there are unique things about the way we taught or maybe the language we used, include that in your nursing notes so the next nurse can have the benefit of what you've learned through that experience. Next slide, please. Oops. So effective teaching improves patient outcomes. This is so well established in the literature that when patients are taught prior to discharge and during those initial visits, they not only do better, but they actually have better outcomes because they're prepared. They understand the importance of hand hygiene and scrubbing the hub, et cetera, and not reusing the green caps, whatever. And as well as they have better, um, they, they feel stronger, they feel more confident, they have less anxiety. They're more prone to follow the directions when they feel like they understand what the expectation is, but also we save a ton of money. We have decreased hospitalizations, we have decreased complications, et cetera. So we may not have been taught the way we should have in our initial nursing education, how to really teach patients, but it is something that we can learn. It's like any other nursing competency. It takes education and practice and evaluation of that practice, but we can become competent patient educators. I think that's my last slide. Yes, thank you so much, Barb. You're so welcome. <laughs> and I think we, we moved the slides around and you ended up going, doing so great. If if people only knew all the things that happened behind the scenes, right? All right, so now we have Jean. Hi, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here with you today and to share some of what we've learned about educating in the pediatric world. I'm gonna start, well, let's see. Pediatrics coming, pediatric patients coming home on IV, IV therapy are more complex today than they've ever been. It's our job to make sure that they receive excellent in-home care. This process begins by teaching the parents or other caregivers in a way that allows them to provide safe care to the child. This is foundational. I'm gonna start by talking about how to create education materials that are accessible, meaning easy to understand and use in the process of giving an infusion. Then I'll move on to how you interact with the child during the teaching process. One note, I'll be referring to the caregivers as parents in this presentation. This is the typical scenario in our patient population. However, I do recognize that there are many types of caregivers out there who are not the child's parents. Next slide, please. Creating accessible education materials starts with your perspective. Your frame of reference should always be to see your content from the point of view of the learner rather than your own. Healthcare workers are really good at laying out the steps of a procedure, but does the learner really understand what you're teaching? Our challenge is to keep them, to keep from creating material that works well for us, but not for them. This isn't as simple as it sounds. Unless we make a concerted effort to see our materials as our intended audience will see them, we'll likely unintentionally default to creating something based on our knowledge, attitudes, literacy skills, and experiences. Next slide. There are many steps to the process of creating accessible education materials. I love what Barbara was talking about with the nursing process. Um, for today, I'll be just touching on the highlights for the stages of planning, creation, and evaluation. Basically, I'm gonna share with you what we learned the hard way. Next slide, please. The two most important aspects of the planning phase are knowing your purpose and knowing your target audience. Next slide. You likely already know why you wanna create the material, but get super clear on the purpose. Is it informational? Is it teaching a procedure? Each of those purposes require an entirely different approach. Once you're clear on your purpose, make sure that purpose is re reflected all the way through the material and check the content periodically to make sure you haven't deviated from your original intent. In this early stage, gather all the information you can that relates to the purpose. This might be a lot, the process is very granular at this stage. 
Next slide. Our target audience in home infusion therapy is very diverse, ranging from folks with no formal education at all to those with PhDs. They're influenced by many factors, including cultural background, literacy level, previous medical knowledge and experiences, and life circumstances. When you're planning and creating education materials, orient your content towards the subset of learners who are the least knowledgeable, the least likely to pay attention, the least skilled at reading or listening. This allows you to reach a larger proportion of your audience. If you can make your materials work well for these learners, it will work well for the rest of your audience too. If you're able to engage your end users in the planning stage, that's all the better. Their feedback can really help you create user-friendly materials. Next slide. For example, years ago, we decided we wanted to create materials for our families to help them understand the basics of infection prevention in order to help prevent CLABSI. Bringing the relatively complex concepts involved in infection prevention to a non-medical audience in a way that they could understand and actually use to inform their actions, this proved to be a big challenge. Our purpose was to create materials that would help eliminate CLABSI. Our target audience was the typical, widely varied home infusion population, largely non-medical. Next slide. We started by taking a common procedure, antibiotic administration, and listing all the steps we asked the parents to do. There are a lot of steps, six pages to be exact. Next slide. Once we had all the steps, we looked for overarching concepts, those things that are often not spoken but lie underneath the steps of a procedure, like scrubbing the hub or keeping sterile parts sterile or protecting the catheter. Why do we do that? Why is it important? Once we'd identified the overarching concepts, we realized there were three times during the process we were asking caregivers to guard against infection, while they were preparing the infusion, during the practice of giving the infusion, and the time between infusions when they needed to protect the IV catheter. Next slide. Now we were ready to start creating the materials. This is the tricky part. We're the experts. We have extensive knowledge of the subject matter and sharing what even feels like the most basic of our understanding will likely be unfamiliar and potentially overwhelming to a non-medical person, especially the, the stressed out parent of a sick child. It's best to operate on a need to know basis rather than providing background information that you think would be nice for them to know. Too much information often creates confusion and can cause the parents to lose interest. Show them what you want them to do using clear, simple steps. Next slide. As you're creating materials, keep in mind, as Barbara was discussing, even highly educated people can have a low level of health literacy. They may recognize the words or phrases they've heard in the hospital or clinic and be nodding along as you teach, but they might not really understand what those words or phrases mean. Add into the equation the massive amount of jargon we use and we can really leave our audience in the weeds. You really need a non-medical editor to review your documents to pick out jargon. It's so much a part of our makeup, we don't even see it. I remember a non-medical ed editor asking me one time, what does this mean, drawing blood? Until that moment, it never occurred to me what a bizarre expression that is. We're collecting blood. The word drawing blood means something entirely different to a non-medical person. Or locking a catheter. What does that mean? Non-medical editors are your friend in the creation process. If they're familiar with the federal guidelines for plain language, even better. These guidelines are an incredible tool for creating documents that are easy to understand by an audience with limited health literacy. They actually coach you to write the content to the sixth grade reading level that Barbara was mentioning earlier. I've included information on health literacy and plain language in a handout that will be available in the resources. Next slide, please. Looking at the material you're creating from your intended audience's point of view will help you identify and remove potential barriers for the parents. If the document looks hard to read, or maybe it's hard to skim, or the text is too dense or too small, or the layout is super busy, the parents might just set the materials down. Same if it's hard to follow because it's poorly organized and has a distracting design, or it's hard to understand because you've used complex words. If you don't attract and hold the reader's attention from the get-go, 
you're never going to make it past the competing demands and time pressures of a busy parent. And if your purpose isn't obvious in the document, the parents might not be able to figure out what you want them to do or see the benefit of doing what you're asking of them. Next slide, please. Next slide. There we go. This is what we ended up with for our infection prevention materials. It's a laminated poster that we give to each infusion patient's parents with simple steps they can take to prevent CLABSI. Prepare, practice, and protect. One side has graphics, and on the next slide, you'll see the other side has the same content using words so the parents can choose how they want to take in the information. What started as six pages of steps was distilled down to a one-page resource. Next slide. In addition, we created a series of videos housed in the tips and how-tos section of our website where parents can access instruction on various infection prevention activities such as hand hygiene or surface cleansing. Next slide. Once you've started using the materials, it's helpful to gather feedback from your readers to see how effective they are. You can do this by conducting interviews or questionnaires, which allow you to check if your learners understand the materials and gives them the opportunity to share their thoughts and opinions. Next slide. You can perform direct observation, which is easily done if you integrate your materials into your in-home teaching process. Make sure your staff are familiar with the materials that you develop, how to introduce them to parents, and how to actually use them when they're doing teaching in the home. This type of modeling is appropriate, or this type of modeling of appropriate use can enhance use by the parents. During this process, staff can observe how parents interact with the materials and if they use them as you intended. And then there's the acid test. Can they actually perform the task that you're teaching after they've used the materials? Next slide. Once you've implemented new materials, keep an eye on your data. Some of the materials we've created have had a direct impact on the number of on-call questions or issues, even on-call home visits. Our one, two, three infection-free materials were associated with a decrease in our CLABSI rate. In addition, PHS just completed a two-year prospective study and statistical analysis of our central lines and found there was no difference in infection or other line complications when parents were accessing the line versus when nurses were accessing the line. To me, as an educator, this speaks to really effective in-home education. Next slide, please. We also use this process with our parental nutrition education documents. As you know, PN is a very complex teach. For many years, we had very large 30 plus page step-by-step -step documents we gave to the parents. Our staff's observation was that those massive documents were left in the binder and were never referred to by the parents after the initial teach. We created quick reference guides, which the parents did use, but we were concerned that they weren't getting all the information they needed in these pared down documents. Next slide, please. When we got a new infusion pump, we worked together as a team to distill the steps for PN administration, looking to only provide the most critical and patient information we felt the parents needed. After we worked this process, we ended up with an eight page document that provided the necessary information without all that extra material that made the previous version so hard for parents to use. We went from 34 pages down to eight pages. Initial reports from the staff were that the parents love these forms or these documents and that they actually use them. Next slide, please. To support HPN training, we created two videos one de detailing how to prepare an HPN infusion and one on how to give an inf HPN infusion using the curling pump. Next slide. So when you're creating education materials, you work from the learners, in this case, the parents' point of view. When you're working with the pediatric patient themselves, they're not the learners. We wanna shift to that child's point of view. There are lots of resources that describe developmental stages for children. And what we found is that many of those theories go right out the window with our patients. Some of them have co cognitive delays related to their diagnosis, and even those who don't may experience cognitive shifts or regression related to the stress of being sick. The very best approach to caring for the pediatric patient is to meet them where they are. 
Next slide. In order to do this, the in-home nurse needs time. They need to follow the parent's lead and they need to pay attention to cues from the child. Let's break each of these down and I'll share some general guidelines on how to best work with children in infusion therapy. Next slide. When you visit a pediatric patient, anticipate longer visits. When I was working adult home infusion, I saw five or six patients a day. When you try to see this many pediatric patients a day, you're gonna have a very rough time of it. Kids do not operate with an understanding of time. If you're a parent, you know this all too well. A routine admission visit with a teach will take around two hours, and a routine follow-up visit with labs and a dressing change will take at least an hour. It takes time to establish trust, and if you try to rush the child, it's likely gonna backfire on you. Kids get scared when they're rushed. They know when you arrive that you're a nurse and that you might hurt them. Spend some time talking to the parents. If they are comfortable, the child will notice that. If you're performing a procedure like an IV start or a blood draw with a dressing change, take a break between tasks to prevent sensory overload for the child. Next slide. With pediatric patients, it's super important to have consistency, sending the same nurse to see the patient each time if possible. This prevents having to start over and building trust with the patient and parents. Next slide, please. Nobody knows the patient, the child, better than their parents, and we must always follow their lead. Make sure to ask the parents before you start the visit how they want their child to be involved in the teaching process and the care and maintenance of their therapy, or the care and management of their therapy. Some kids are super curious and it's best to include them. With other kids, attempting to include them can result in a massive meltdown. Never make assumptions and for sure don't do things just to make it easier for you during your visit. Next slide. The parents are there with the child day in and day out, often juggling many other responsibilities. If we set up a pattern of including the child without talking to the parents first, maybe we give them clean supplies to play with or have them push the plunger for their flush, it can make it rough for the parents after we're gone. Mind you, for some kids, this type of inclusion is a terrific way of working with them. For example, saline flushes often give patients a bad taste in their mouth. Having the child be the one to actually push the plunger and give the flush can make that a lot less of an issue. But if after we're gone, the child is constantly wanting to handle their supplies or quote, help the parents, it can create huge issues. The bottom line, if the parent says no, we need to let them drive the bus. We're there to teach the parents how to care for the line and give the infusion. But we can teach the child when they should tell their parents about something, like if the dressing gets loose or if the catheter hurts. Also, check with the child, with the parents, before you give the child rewards like treats or stickers. Some kiddos might insist on rewards for every care they, after they've gotten just one reward. This can make it tough for the parents. One of our nurses gave a, a child a temporary tattoo sticker and the mom was very upset. She didn't want her little girl to even know about tattoos. You just don't know all the intricacies of a family and how they work together, unless you ask. Next slide. The best way to approach caring for a child is to pay attention to their cues. They're giving cues all the time. Enter their space with caution so you don't scare them. But if they do run away, just let them go. Work around the edges of their space. Talk with the parents and set up your procedures. Do whatever documentation you can at that point. Hopefully the child will become curious and start coming near. If they don't, have the parents get them and bring them to you. Next slide. It helps to find common ground with the child. Look at what toys are in their play space. If they're playing with a Barbie doll, maybe share a story about your Barbie when you were a kid. If they're playing video games, show an interest, share a story. We only had checkers to play with when I was a kid. Or maybe ask a question or two. Sometimes you can make part of your assessment like a game. One of our nurses plays the stinky feet game with her patient. When she takes off his socks so she can weigh him, she pretends his feet are so stinky. The child is giggling and so proud of his stinky feet. Be willing to play, to get a little goofy. It's actually one of the fringe benefits of being a pediatric nurse. Next slide. Watch for the opening. Wait until they're ready before you make eye contact or touch them. Tell them you're, what you're gonna do before you do it and don't lie to them. If a procedure is gonna hurt, 
Tell them it's gonna hurt, but only for a few seconds. Explain that it's okay for them to cry, but they must hold very still. The next slide. So while the gold standard in pediatric care is to pay attention to the child's cues, there are a few age-specific guidelines that can provide a helpful platform for you. I've broken the developmental stages into these four categories, infant, preschool, school age, and teenagers. Let's take a look at each of these stages. Next slide. Infants can be a little easier to work with than some of the other stages because they usually don't have the same fear patterns or negative associations that older children do. Just smiling or otherwise engaging the child can break the ice. Try not to make sudden moves that can startle the infant and get them crying and do the quieter tasks of your assessment first, like listening to the chest. You can't hear breath sounds or a heartbeat on a crying baby. So start with the non-invasive procedures and move to the more invasive ones. Next slide. Preschool children may be more fearful of your visit. They can usually peg you as a nurse, even if you're in street clothes, and they know, and they know that that might mean that pain is coming. Involve the parents here for comfort. You may even do the assessment or procedure with the child in the parent's lap. Take time to build trust and play, as I previously discussed. It's often helpful to have a toy or a book or video to use as a distraction during the procedure. Have the parents help with that. If the parents are okay with rewards, they can be helpful motivation for a child of this age. Sometimes kids are afraid if they even see their IV catheter and other times they're fascinated with it and wanna play with it or put it in their mouth. Use distraction methods during your procedure and be sure to cover the IV catheter with long sleeves or a mesh of some type to keep it out of sight after the procedure. As for timing, read the child's cues. Sometimes you're best off warming them up for a while before you attempt to access that port or change the dressing or draw blood. Other times, that's the very first thing you should do when you get there, or the child will worry and ramp themselves up into a frenzy if they know what's coming and then they have to, have to wait. Next slide. School-age children tend to be curious and want to watch everything. Often no one has ever offered to let them watch or taken the time to teach them about what's going on with their body. They're almost always listening and watching, even if you don't offer to include them. This varies widely. Some kids are more savvy than others. In fact, don't be surprised if during your next visit, they remind you to make sure to wipe the end cap. Parents sometimes report that the child reminds them of the steps when they're giving the infusion. When they ask questions, explain things to them in concrete terms. Be careful of jargon. Describe an incision as an opening in the skin rather than a cut, for example, or an IV catheter as a tube to give your medicine rather than a needle. Check with the parents first, but the curiosity of this age group makes it natural for them to want to participate in their care. Allow them to handle clean supplies or even push the plunger on the syringe for their flush. This kind of engagement helps demystify the process and makes it less scary for them. By the way, if you do allow them to push the, the plunger, make sure you do the hookup and flush enough to assess line patency first and then have them help with the rest of the flush. Next slide, please. It's generally good, whoops, can you back up a couple? One more, there we go. It's generally good to include teenagers in the teaching process and it may be appropriate to teach them how to give their own dose with parental supervision. This age group is often curious about the disease process and what's happening with their body, unless they're the type of teenager who wants to know absolutely nothing about any of it. Again, follow their cues. If they're curious, explain their disease process and treatment and answer their questions honestly. Teenagers are pretty much universally private and modest when it comes to their body. Allow for confidentiality and privacy as appropriate and be sensitive to issues of body image distortion related to the IV catheter. Helping them find ways to creatively hide a PIC or Hickman catheter can make a big difference in how they feel about their therapy. Next slide, please. One final tip, performing a pre-admission assessment before the first visit can really help the nurse know what she's walking into. Our IV coordinator contacts the parents before the visit to gather whatever information she can about the family history and in-home dynamics, to get a sense of the child's previous experiences with healthcare, just to help us understand what the nurse can expect during that first visit. 
That one phone call can help avoid major issues just by alerting us in advance. And next slide. Even though there are some major differences, differences in caring for the pediatric patient, the foundational tenets are the same no matter what age your patient is. Meet every patient where they are, read their cues, and view their care from their point of view. That's all I have. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jean. We're going to turn it over now to Jennifer. We're really excited to have her uh, join us as well. All right. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Jean. It's my privilege to be here with you today to talk about patient education. I will be sharing tools that can be used for training and education of nursing agency staff, address how patient literacy and language barriers may impact patient understanding and learning, and share innovative tools used to aid in effective patient teaching. First slide. At the time of referral, a thorough patient assessment is completed by an intake nurse. The intake nurse assesses the patient to determine appropriateness for receiving home infusion services and to identify the availability of care and services to meet that patient's needs. Referral information is gathered by the intake assistant for the intake RN to review. Pre-discharge teaching is then performed by a nurse clinician with a return demonstration or teach back by the patient or primary caregiver to validate their understanding and competency. The patient and caregiver are actively involved in the care planning process. Printed educational materials are provided. Supplemental education and reinforcement is then provided by the home health nurse. The home health RN is responsible for weekly home visits for patient assessment, line care, and lab work if ordered. The infusion supply inventory count may be obtained by the home health nurse during the weekly visit. Ongoing case management and support for the patient and the nursing agency is accomplished by telephone and electronic communication methods. Next slide. Business growth, geographic expansion, and the addition of many new specialty infusion medications has made it necessary for us to partner with additional nursing agencies in our service territory. Care partner coordination and education is the responsibility of the nursing department in collaboration with the sales and marketing departments. At Chartwell, the regional nurse manager is intimately involved in this process. The process involves identifying a service area need locating nursing agencies for infusion care. We often seek recommendations from and solicit feedback from our hospital case management teams. Executing the contract, then sharing infusion policies and procedures with the contracted agencies, providing training and education on site to include infusion pump in servicing, and finally providing ongoing training and re-education on an annual basis. In the future, we will, we will be utilizing web conferencing for virtual training and specific education required for new therapies that are coming out. Next slide. Charwell is affiliated with a major regional and academic health system, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and Transplant Center. We service a diverse population and are also providing care for many international patients. To provide effective patient-centered care, we have access to the UPMC Center for International Patient Relations for medical translation service needs. We have remote interpreter services for foreign language interpretation over the phone through CIRICOM. CIRICOM provides access to trained medical interpreters 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All patient educational materials are developed by Chartwell clinicians in collaboration with our sales and marketing team. All education materials are then vetted through the corporate marketing department for a review for readability score. We have converted several patient teaching guides to other languages, including Spanish. Patient teaching guides have been designed with picture tutorials for non-English speaking customers. Therapy specific videos are available on our company website for visual assistance. Next slide. Now I'd like to share several of the innovative tools that we use for patient education. 
This is the Going Home with Chartwell Home Infusion patient brochure. This pamphlet is given to patients before they leave the hospital. The infusion nurse who conducts teaching can give it to the patient or the Chartwell account manager on site at the hospital will give it to the patient. The account manager is the single point of contact. The purpose of the brochure is to address common questions and provide answers to patients and their families about receiving home infusion therapy. Some frequently asked questions include, how do I learn to administer my therapy? Will a nurse always be there to administer my infusion? What if I have an IV problem in the middle of the night? And who is going to pay for my home infusion therapy? Next slide. This is our patient welcome handbook. The purpose of this 40 page spiral bound handbook is for patient education. The patient welcome handbook was developed in 2012 and gets reviewed annually and revised as needed to include patient education and marketing materials that need revised. Patient safety reminders were incorporated throughout our handbook. For example, on page four, patients are reminded that they and their caregiver are part of the healthcare team. They are the last quality check to ensure the highest level of patient safety. A printed reminder that with each new medication shipment and before taking a dose of medication, they should look at each container to ensure it is correct, the correct medication and that it's labeled correctly. So how did we go about planning and redesigning designing our handbook? Uh, first, the marketing project manager met with each department to collect information. The new patient packet previously used was reviewed and revisions were made. We consolidated all service lines into one patient handbook. The patient can refer to the handbook cover to identify the phone number to reach their service, whether it be infusion, specialty, or enteral. The patient welcome handbook is coded as a supply item in our patient care management system. This way the intake nurse can add the item code when creating the delivery slip for the initial delivery to a new patient. Next slide. This is an example of our patient teaching guide. We have a large library of therapy specific teaching guides. The nurse clinician providing education refers to the teaching guide to reinforce steps for administering a specific therapy, including the catheter flushing protocol and how to operate the infusion pump. Like the patient welcome handbook, the patient teaching guides are also coded as a supply item in our computer system. The intake nurse adds the appropriate teaching guide code to the delivery slip to be picked and added to the package for initial delivery. Next slide. And this is our TPN placemat. This is an actual 28 inch by 18 inch plastic mat. In planning for the TPN placemat, our marketing project manager was assigned the role of project lead. She gathered a team of clinicians from pharmacy and nursing department to work with the marketing team to identify barriers to TPN administration in the home. The team then created goals and objectives for design and development of the placemat. Some key objectives were, number one, reduce central line associated bloodstream infections. Two, promote patient safety and advocacy. We wanted to empower our patients to be involved in their care and take an active role in safe medication use. And three, provide an educational visual aid to help our patients have the least stressful infusion experience possible. We decided on the placemat format as you can see, it is an outstanding visual. It also provides a clean surface and designated area that can be disinfected prior to and after each TPN setup and administration. All supply and therapy images are to scale and labeled to eliminate confusion about which products and supplies the patient or caregiver is using to prepare their, their TPN for infusion. We worked with our corporate print shop for ordering and printing. Each placemat is printed, laminated, and shipped in a separate mailing tube to ensure they will lay flat. The placemat is listed as a supply item in the patient management system. 
Again, our intake nurse adds the placemat to the delivery slip when generating the initial delivery for a new TPN patient. Next slide. We are now creating additional placemats for various infusion therapies. This is an example of the placemat for patients receiving infliximab. Next slide. Patient education videos have been created. The videos are accessible from our webpage and they provide an effective visual aid that patients can view, rewind, pause, and go back to again and again, again, and again if needed. The step-by-step -step instructional videos provide added support and assurance to the patient and their caregiver when administering their infusion therapy independently for the very first time. In planning for the video project, our marketing project manager was assigned the role again as project lead. She contacted the videographer to discuss the plan and the timeline. We utilized a corporate approved vendor who came to us with previous knowledge and experience. So he helped guide us through the process. A project team was formed to develop the script, the content of which was derived from our patient teaching guides. The video was filmed in a conference room with clinicians and marketing team members present to assure quality and accuracy. Plenty of stops and adjustments were made along the way with consultation from the videographer throughout. Once the script and the video shoot were finalized, voiceover talent was hired by the vid videographer to read the script. Our team reviewed the video several times before reaching a final cut. I intended to wrap up today by sharing this example patient education video titled IV Administration via Freedom Syringe Pump. Since we are running a little short on time, I encourage you to visit chartwellpa.com to view our videos directly from our website. Um, you will access those under uh, the website under the patient link, home infusion therapy, and then patient teaching guide video portal on the website. Thank you for your attention. I hope that you found this information to be informative and have come away with some useful ideas. If you would like additional information, please feel free to contact me. My email address is provided on the slide. Back to you, Jen. Thank you, ladies. That was just an amazing program. I know I learned a lot. Uh, makes me want to get back to patient care. We don't have any questions. Um, so I would like to just thank Barb, Jean, and Jennifer for sharing their knowledge with us and a many thanks to McKesson for their generous sponsorship. As a quick reminder, in order to get CE, please follow the link in the follow-up email to take the short quiz within 24 hours. Make sure to check back at NHIA's website for future sessions of the summer series. Thank you to all of our home infusion providers and suppliers who are working on the front lines to keep patients safely in their homes. We are looking forward to bringing you more education each week during our summer NHIA series. Thank you and have a great day.